Jimmy, I'm a recovering addict. Hey, Jimmy. Clean through God's grace and God's mercy. I want to thank ISNAC for uh, extending the invitation, inviting me out to, uh, to do the Saturday night meeting. They ain't take a risk. Six Step says that uh, self-righteousness is a strong, confident belief in oneself. And I understand clearly that God has blessed me with the ability to stand at the podium and share my experience, strength, and, help, and, and hope in a manner in which he has blessed me to help other people within helping myself. So I don't apologize for being invited, but I am grateful. Before we get started, what I'd like to do, man, is I would like to ask you to take a moment of silence and invite your God in, and I'll invite my God in, and when it's all said and done, God gets the praise and the glory, and we just stay clean. So if we could do that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I got an NA sponsor who 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 got an NA sponsor. I serve one God, I attend one fellowship, I work one set of steps, and I have one woman in my life. Because one is too many and a thousand is never enough. I know there's some folks that want to know what's that all about. Why he bringing books to the podium? We want him to share his story. But I need to ask you to ask yourself a question. Did you ever go to the crack house without the push of the lighter or the stem? Did you ever go to the shooting gallery without the works and the lighter and the spoon? Then why would you come to the place that saved your life without the proper tools to help you save your life. I don't apologize for bringing my literature. And I may and I may not endeavor into it. But if I need it, it is here. I don't know about y'all, but I could feel God in the room tonight. I don't know if y'all could feel God in the room tonight like I could feel God in the room tonight. I could feel God in my spirit in a mighty way like I haven't felt God in my spirit in a long, long, long time. I'm talking about God's grace in my life is so prominent. I want to ask you if you can kill praise God even when stuff ain't going your way. It's easy to praise God when you get that job. When your girl does what you think she should do. When you get that car you've been praying for. When Shorty gives you the right look at the right time. But what about when your baby's born and almost dies? Can you still praise God? What about when your wife is stricken with cancer and you got to go through major surgeries can you still praise God what about when your sister your baby sister at 17 years old life is taken away in an accident in which your mom is driving can you still praise God I come to talk about my relationship with God as given to me through the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous
My clean date is May 1st, 1992. I got 11 years and 10 months. And on May 1st, I'll celebrate 12 years clean. All right, guys. All right. And I ain't gonna say if God's willing, because God's been willing all my life. I'm the one who's been unwilling to be obedient to the God in which I serve. I got a home group. It's the Read and Recover group. We meet on Tuesday nights at 4th and Walnut, Roselle, New Jersey. It's a basic text meeting. I share that because if you ain't got no home group, then you're still homeless. And if you ain't got no sponsor, then you got a fool for a sponsor. And if you ain't working the steps, you subject to use. That's right. Oh yeah, I come to shatter the illusion. I come to stomp on some reservations tonight. Our literature said as our goal is recovery through the 12 steps, not mere abstinence. It says our best guarantee against relapse is to work the 12 steps. So I come to talk about how the 12 steps have revolved in my life from a man who couldn't hold his head up to a man that's standing in Indianapolis, Indiana, 11 years and 10 months later, sharing at the banquet the dream, the one dream. When the addict stops using and works the program, lost dreams awaken and new possibilities arise. I want to talk about May 21st, 1992, Eatontown, New Jersey. I had 20 days clean. I was at a convention, the New Jersey Regional Convention. I had been a member of involvement in that convention for five years. My introduction to Narcotics Anonymous happened in 1986. But I couldn't stop using. I couldn't identify with y'all. I was only 20 years old. I wasn't as sick as you folks up in this camp. I was hearing jokers talking about shooting dope for 30 years. I was only 20 years old. I heard addicts talking about I'm homeless, jobless, and penniless. I said, well, I ain't like that. I'm not as sick as y'all. I don't belong here. I tried to get clean in the suburbs. I grew up in the, in the ghetto, in the projects, man, in New Jersey. I tried to get clean in the, in the suburbs, and I ain't trying to separate myself, but I'm talking about how powerful and insidious the disease of addiction is. I was accustomed to a certain lifestyle, and when I tried to get clean, I wasn't around the same folks that I was using with. I was around completely different folks, not clean folks, different folks. Not that they look different, they talk different. They didn't have the slang I talk. They didn't come from the streets I came from. So the disease said, there ain't no way these folks can help you because they ain't like you. So if you're here tonight and you think that we ain't like you, you need to check yourself. Because we more like you than we different than you. I'm not just talking about skin color. I'm talking about how the disease affects us mentally, physically, and spiritually. I'm talking about how the disease attacks us, our low self-esteem, how it comes at us in avenues in which we never thought it could ever attack. So I came here, man, in, in, in 86 and 87 and 88 and 89 and 90 and 91. And in New Jersey, on the regional meeting directory, there's eight suggestions, and one of them is don't use and go to meetings. I got to go to meetings part down. It was the don't use I was having a hard time with. <laughs> I mean, listen, I, I, I want to share. I want the newcomers to understand what I'm talking about. I mean, I remember going to meetings, man, and the hugs and feeling a part of and feeling like I belonged and like I just fit in. Now I can get in where I fit in and I feel like I was down with y'all. But the moment the meeting ended and I went home, I was all alone again. I don't know if you could identify, I would read the book, I would call folks, but I was still alone on the inside. I was insecure and lonely, and I hated myself so much that the only thing I knew to do was to put something in my body to ease the self-hatred that was in the depths of my spirit. I was taught from a young boy to hate myself. My father told me all my life, you ain't shit, boy, I ain't never gonna be shit. Y'all can talk about words don't hurt, but that's bullshit up in this camp. When you're told you ain't nothing all your life, no matter what you do, no matter how many home runs you hit or how many A's you get or how many certificates you get from school, when your pops tells you you ain't shit, boy, that's all you ever remember. Yes. 
So I came to Narcotics Anonymous, man, and I hated myself, and I would come to meetings, man, and I would hug y'all, and we would talk, and I wouldn't want to use when I was at the meeting, man. People would say, man, you wanted to use, you didn't tell us. No, I didn't want to use when I came to the meeting. I didn't want to use during the meeting. I didn't want to use after the meeting. It was when I went home by myself. I actually, I didn't go by myself. I went with my wife, but spiritually, I was all alone because I had abandoned my relationship with God long time ago. I was told that God was punishing vengeful brimstone and fire and all the burning bushes and all of that stuff. That's why I'm so grateful for the basic text in the third step where it talks about we no longer have to live in the dogma. And dogma is not a religion. We're going to educate some folks tonight. Dogma is Greek for the word doctrine and the word doctrine means something taught. The people I was raised around taught me that God was punishing, but I understand today that God is nothing less than merciful. I understand clearly that it was God's grace that got me to Narcotics Anonymous. I didn't make the decision to come up in this camp. I didn't make the decision on, on, May, on, on May 1st, 1992 to get clean. God said, boy, it's time now. Your time has come, son. It's time. The war is over. Recovery needs to begin now. That's why I'm in a spot in my life and my recovery, man, where I meet folks where they at. When they threw me out the crack house, God met me at the door. God did. I hear stuff like you need to change the condition of your heart for God to can change your condition. But that means you got a conditional God. I don't got a conditional God. He met my now behind at the door. When I came out the crack house in Wee Craig Towers, Newark, New Jersey, my God was standing right there and he just grabbed me and held me and walked me to my truck and he drove me to my house. And when I got to my house, my wife told me that she had separated the house and she was going to take the inside and I could have the outside. <laughs> I've been with my wife, man, I'm 38 years old. On, on, on Tuesday, I'll be with my wife 23 years. In May, in May, I'll be married 15 years. On May 27th, I'll be married 15 years. And my wife told me a hundred times, all the times I used, man, my wife told me that, that you ain't no good, you a junkie, you ain't never gonna get clean. You know, her hurt was causing her to say hurtful things, but I just brushed that stuff off every time she ever said that type of stuff to me. I was like, you don't, you still don't understand. You don't suffer with what I suffer with. Right, Dow, you understand what I'm talking about. You don't suffer with this, baby, so you don't understand. And she said, I understand clearly so-and-so been clean since y'all was in rehab. She said, I ain't beat for that. Boy, you ain't ready to get clean. And I would just brush it off and use more and not feel it, but on this day, on this day, she said, I hate you. And I'm here to tell a newcomer that if you're here, the drugs will no longer work anymore. Your using days are over. Because I felt it, I had used every day in the month of April. Every single day I smoked crack. Every day I ate one piece of pizza, two little Debbie cakes, and the quarter juices from the bodega on the corner. In 30 days, that's all I ate. When I came back to Narcotics Anonymous, I weighed 108 pounds. My eyes were sunk in the back of my head. I had uh, two pair of sweatpants on underneath a pair of jeans. I had a 26 inch belt, which was on a 22 loop. <laughs> You could see my ribs through my stomach. I had some hair. It was greasy and funky and smelly. And my wife told me she hated me and for the first time I heard what she said. See, I used for three reasons. When I felt good, I wanted to feel better. When I felt bad, I wanted to feel better. And when I didn't know how I felt, I wanted to feel better. But at the end, the drugs turned. Because I still felt the same low life, destructive way about myself even after doing a hit. The drugs didn't work no more for me. And I remember, man, my wife backed me into a corner in the kitchen and there was a knife 
a butcher knife on the on the counter and I can remember vividly, man. I can remember like the disease saying, come on boy, you know Pac will give you five G's for your truck. Just stab her and take the title and we can bounce, fam. I got you. I don't know if your disease talked to you like that. My disease said, I got you, fam. I got you. You just do this. I got you. You don't really like her anyhow. You know you can get five G's for the truck. We can really get our groove on. We'll sweat the small stuff later. But even though I didn't believe in God for real, for real, that moment, I went into prayer and I said, oh God, please, if you're there, don't allow me to cause harm anymore. And I opened my eyes and I looked at my wife and I said, baby, is there anywhere I can stay tonight and I'll get out tomorrow? And she said, boy, you ain't welcome here no more. You got to go. You're now behind me to leave this house. You have destroyed my life for the last time. And I called my father, who was a cop, and he said, boy, if you come on my block, I'll shoot you. <laughs> 25 years on the force. 25 years on the force. That joker ain't never pull his gun. <laughs> yeah, I could hear it in the background. <laughs> come on over. He ain't going to call the cops. He just going to shoot me. We laugh, man, but that's where the disease of addiction drove me. So, newcomer, I want you to understand that I can identify right where you're at. And in 1987, I went to treatment, man, and, and, and I was in treatment, and we, we had a, an H&I panel come up, and there was this brother that came up, and, and, and he had a raccoon hat and a sheepskin coat and Lee jeans with the shell-top Adidas with the fat laces, and he dipped when he walked. And he rolled up in the camp, and, he, and, and I wasn't sure if he was Run or D from Run DMC. <laughs> but he had this fine girl with him. She was holding. God, dog, was she holding. And I had been to a couple meetings. I heard, if you want what we got, do what we do. So I wanted what he had. <laughs> I didn't know that was an H&I panel and they were both NA members. I thought that was his girl. <laughs> but I was afraid of this joker. He talked real slick. And even though I had come from the streets, I was still afraid of this joker. And I didn't really talk to him too tough. And he bounced and I got out and I used and I got out and I used and I got out and I used. And that stuff went on for like five or six years. And in, 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 in uh, like July of, of 92, I was in treatment and I went to a meeting on a Friday night and and, and I was in the back of the meeting. I had 37 days clean, and I wanted to smoke. Bad. I could taste it. I could feel it. I had the shits. I was puking. But at 37 days clean, I was too proud to tell anybody I wanted to get high. Because the disease said, boy, you know too much about recovery to be wanting to get high. You can't tell nobody you want to use, boy. You be quoting the literature and stuff. So I sat in the back of the meeting, man, and, and I put my best I'm fine face on. And this cat up in the front of the room raised his hand, and he shared that he was in multiple relationships. But he knew that through sponsorship, God, and the steps, that he didn't have to live like that no more. And I was like, dog, he just putting himself out there. I want to smoke crack. I can't tell nobody. He talking about he in multiple relationships. But he know through God the steps and sponsorship that he don't have to live like that no more. I said, I might need to talk to that joker. And I rolled up after the meeting, and when I seen his face, it was the same cat from treatment from like 87. But now he had a sweatshirt on, a pair of Lee jeans and Tim's. He was just Joe Banana, one of the bunch. <laughs> but, but there was an aura about him. I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. There was, this, there was this God about him that intrigued me to him. And, and, and I, you know, I looked down at the floor and I said, hey, um, listen, do you think if there's any way possible that maybe you could think, you know, maybe if you think, <laughs> you think, um, do you think maybe, uh, maybe you could think, um, um, hey, um, you think, um, hey, I need a sponsor. <laughs> and I could see his head going, <laughs> And he said, he said, sure, Jimmy, I would be honored to be your sponsor. 
And I remember, man, I wanted to, I wanted to do what, what everybody else was doing. I wanted to do the suggested readings. I said, um, I said, we, I got my basic text sponsor, and we're going to do Who's the Attic. He said, Who's the Attic? Oh, no, you're not. I said, You sponsor so and so. He did Who's the Attic. He said, You ain't so and so. Okay. What is the NA program? He said, Boy, if you don't know by now. I said, Why are we here? He said, Boy, come on now. I said, Well, if, if, if we ain't going to do suggested readings, what are we going to do? He said, you're going to work the steps. I said, hold on. Can I get six months first? He said, your track record says you can't get six days. You know, he was about 6'3". I wanted to punch him in his head. But I said, OK. I said, well, why do you think the steps is going to work? He said, Jimmy, when you go to the doctor and you tell him what your symptoms are, tell the doctor that you're coughing and you're sneezing and you're congested, when he gives you the antidote to your symptoms, does he tell you to wait six months? Or does he tell you to take your now behind to the doctor and start getting better, to the pharmacist and start getting better right now? I said, the doctor said get better right now. He said, well, open your basic text with your good shan ass. With your basic text quoting ass. Open the basic text to page 19 and read the last paragraph before the first step where it says that the steps are the antidote to the disease of addiction. That they're our survival kit. They're the principles that make our recovery possible. He said, boy, your only hope is to work the 12 steps. He said, you can't wait a year. You can't wait six months. You too sick. He said, you know, you, you, got, you, you got the sick, the sicker, the sickest, and then there's you. And we started working steps, and, and, and I'm going to talk about some stuff, man. I want y'all, I want some newcomers to understand some stuff, man. I remember some cats telling me, yo, man, you need to get a sponsor, get your basic text out, start working some steps. Because, Jimmy, that's the only way you're going to stay clean. And then all of a sudden, at like nine months clean, I was on the fourth step. And these same jokers said, boy, you need to slow your roll. You need to back it down a step. You need to take it. Easy does it, fam. Easy does it. And I'd be like, hold on. Ain't you the joker that told me to get a sponsor and work the steps? And I remember going to my sponsor. I said, hey, sponsor, so-and-so said I need to slow my roll. He said, so-and-so been here five years, ain't worked the fourth step. Yeah. He said, so-and-so scared you're going to take his sponsees. He said, so-and-so might tell you he love you, but he a little jealous right now. Jimmy, he been here five years. They asking you to speak at meetings. He want to know why he ain't being asked. He said, Jimmy, you, you, you refuse to shine less because jokers around you don't shine as much. My sponsor encouraged me to work the steps. When I got my opportunity to share for the first time, he encouraged me to go on and share. We're going to go back to May 21st, 1992. I was in Eatontown at the New Jersey Regional Convention. And I'm in a meeting, man, and I'm feeling bad about myself. And self-hatred is prominent in my life. And I'm not liking myself. I'm in treatment for like the fifth or sixth time. And I'm hating myself. I'm like, man, I should know, but I should not be here. I should be at the convention and enjoying myself. And I remember I was on the back wall. And there was a brother, may God be pleased with his spirit, Jamil, from, from Brooklyn. And he was up at the podium, and he was sharing, and folks was going, mmm, oh, damn, oh, ooh-wee. Did you hear what that brother said? Oh, man. And I, I perked up. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that one day. I'm going to do that, man. I'm going to help folks like he's helping us right now. One day, God's going to use me in a mighty way. And I set out to work the 12 steps because I wanted to share. I ain't the addict that says, y'all called, so I came. I love to do this stuff. I love to be at the podium. I love to share the good news that you never, 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 never have to use again. Hey! And 
And because I volunteered, because I volunteered to work the steps, and I volunteered, I went to God and I said, God, if you truly love me like you tell me you love me, then allow me to live my life based in serving you and glorifying you and all that I say and do. He said, well, son, if you really want to serve me, then there needs to be some stuff that needs to happen. Your character needs to be tested. You need to have an understanding that you cannot stand at the podium and help other folks until you've walked through your own struggles. He said, son. He said, son. The destructive force, call it what you will, the devil, the destructive force, the evil force, Darth Vader, <laughs> that black cloud, that thing that comes at you in the middle of the night when your senses and conscience is down, that thing that comes at you and says, listen, what your good shan ass, you at the podium quoting the basic text, but pow, take this, we're going to take your daughter. We're going to put your daughter in the hospital when she's two years old. We're going we gonna to give her asthma. We ain't going to let her come out the hospital for over 16 days with your good shan ass. Now what you going to do, Mr. Basic Text Quota? <laughs> Mr. Sponsoring some folks? What you going to do with your good shan ass? Come on and tell us, tell us now how your life is. Come on and praise God now if you dare. I called my sponsor, and I kept writing, and I kept coming to meetings, and I kept praising God even when I didn't believe that it was okay to praise God. I kept telling folks that I was going to be all right, that I knew God loved me so much. God loved me so much that maybe my daughter wouldn't stay alive, but he would get me from one side to the other. I didn't pray for God to save my daughter. I prayed for God to give my family the strength necessary to deal with whatever his will may be. My daughter went in the hospital, man. And I remember, you know, my, my wife, is she's a woman, and she does the motherly thing. And she was at the hospital for a day and a half. And I went to the hospital, and, and I remember telling her, baby, you need to go home, and you need to get some rest and get your clothes, because I know you're coming back to stay here, baby, but go on and go home. And I remember, I remember the doctor and the nurse coming in and saying, Mr. Trowbridge, we need you to bring Ashley. We need to go in this room over here, and we need to put an IV in her hand. And I remember going in there, I didn't know what they was going to do because, you know, that wasn't my thing. So we go in the room and, and, and they, they pulled my daughter's hand and they stuck the needle and she pulled her hand out. And, and they said, oh, if we can't get it in, we don't know what we're going to do. she got to have antibiotics. So, so they, they put my daughter on her back and they said, come here, Daddy. You need to hold your daughter down so we can put the IV in her hand. And I leaned over my daughter, man, and all I ever wanted my whole entire life was to just be a dad. And, I leaned over my daughter, and as I'm leaning over my daughter to hold her down, she's looking in my eyes, and she's saying, no, dad, dad, no, hurt, dad, dad, no, hurt, dad, dad, no, dad, dad, no, dad, dad, no, hurt, dad, dad, no, hurt, dad, dad. And you know I wanted to tell that doctor to stop, but I knew that he was doing what was necessary to get my daughter better. I'm talking about powerless on a deep level. I'm talking about when the one thing God has entrusted you with, you can't even protect from harm. And I got in touch with what Dow talked about last night. She wasn't mine anyway. He only put her in my care until he wanted her back. And I understand clearly at that moment that he was allowing me to grow spiritually so that I could come to Narcotics Anonymous and share the good news that if I just surrendered my life and my will to his care, that he would walk me through whatever was going to come down my path. And I bought a house and lost my job three days later. My mortgage was $1,600. I ain't sell no drugs. I ain't sell no bootleg clothes, no bootleg cell phones, no bootleg cable boxes. I'm sharing this stuff because you know that when, 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 when you're down, the disease comes. I have folks talk about just give me two G's, I'll flip it, fam. You have 10 G's in a month. I said, well, what you going to do with the money? They said, we're going to sling some stuff. We ain't going to touch it. I said, how am I going to sling drugs when my whole purpose in life is to carry the message to the addict that still suffers? How dare I kill the very people God has saved my life to help get clean? How dare, how dare I cross the boundaries in which I made a commitment to not cross? 
And I traveled to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I worked for like no money. And I left my wife and my daughter at home and I called them every day and I made a couple meetings for the four months I was in Albuquerque and, and I paid my bills and we didn't have to do nothing illegal and I came home and I got a job back in the union and I've been with the company for over 10 years now. See, God just needed to know that I could meet the condition so that he could give me the job and which he always wanted me to have, but he needed me to meet the condition in order for him to give me the job that he knew I deserved, but he needed, to understand, he needed for me to understand that he gave it to me, and it's just my job to maintain it. And then in 99, Haley Amanda was born June 9, 1999. And on July 2nd, we put her in the hospital with a blood virus. And the doctor came in the room and they did a spinal tap. She was three weeks old. And they did a spinal tap. They don't like to do that on adults, much less newborns. And the doctor came in and he said, Mr. Trowbridge, there's nothing we can do for your daughter. She has a blood virus, which is incurable. He said, we could give her antibiotics and hope for the best. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's because you don't believe in God, I guess. I said, you do your job, God will do his job, and we'll see who has the final word. And I went to the hospital every day. I was working 14-hour days at a, at, a, at, a, at a car plant in New Jersey. And I was working 14-hour days, and I would leave my job, and I would go back, and I would go to the hospital, and I would hold my daughter, and I would sing to her, sunshine, my only sunshine, please don't take my sunshine away. And I would tell her that I loved her. And that it was going to be all right if she would just trust in her mommy and her daddy that she would be okay. And I would hold my wife's hand and I would tell her, baby, it's going to be all right no matter what happens. It's going to be all right, baby. No matter what happens, baby, it's going to be all right. And I would tell my oldest daughter, who was six, that just wanted a baby sister. And that's really all that she wanted was just to have somebody to play with. And now maybe she wasn't going to have that somebody to play with. And we didn't shelter her from that. See, I was sheltered from stuff when I was a kid. When folks got sick, we went away. We went to our aunt's house, or our uncle's house, or, or our grandparents' house, and we were sheltered. We didn't shelter my six-year-old from having to deal with the traumas. That's why I struggle in the here and now with dealing with traumatic stuff, because I was never given the tools necessary to deal with trauma in my life. We brought the six-year-old up, and we said, this is your baby sister. This is Haley Amanda, baby. And if you just pray with us, she's going to get better. And she said, Daddy, I don't know what to say. I said, just tell God that you want your baby sister to come home safe. And she would stand next to me and she would say, Dear God, if you could just let her send Haley home, we'll be all right. And I would tell her that I love her so much and that it was going to be all right. If she would just hold on, it was going to be all right. And Haley's going to be five in June. Because God's greater than any weapon that could be formed against me. And in May of 2001, we got a phone call, April, I'm sorry, of, of 2001, we got a phone call that, that the, uh, the blood virus was gone 100%. That my daughter's asthma, which, which was threatening to take her life, was at a point of comfort. She could come off the, the defibrillator three times a day and the nebulize three times a day and go on this pill. And she was allowed to dance and play softball and lead a normal life. And we hit our knees and we thanked Almighty God. We called our sponsor. We thanked him for walking us through the storm. We came to meetings and we thanked the very addicts who came to our house and prayed with us. And I called the men I sponsor and I thanked them for walking me through the storm and loving me even when I didn't have the ability to call them back. And in May of 2002, I celebrated 10 years clean. Well, in May of 2001, I need to backtrack. My wife started having pains in her chest. She was diagnosed with congestive heart failure at 35 years old. And we went to the cardiologist and, we, and I walked my wife through this. I mean, I didn't send her there and keep the kids. We got a babysitter and I went with my wife and I asked the doctor questions. What, what does my wife need, doc, to get better? And he said, he, she needs her stress to be released. She needs her stress to be lightened. I said, we got two kids. He said, I understand. So you're gonna have to step up. In his own way, he said, with your good shan ass. <laughs> And 
And for almost nine months, I made my home group in no other meeting. I made my home group and I let the people who were closest to me know that I was struggling, but that I needed to be home because my wife couldn't afford to have any stress in her life. And in May of 2002, we got a phone call that um, the congestive heart failure had healed to a point of comfort. So we hit our knees, we called our sponsor, came to meeting, we thanked Almighty God for His grace one more time. And in June, I came home from work. And my wife sat me down and we were doing some work around the house so there was some stuff going on and you know, she was trying to spend more money than I was trying to spend and I thought she was gonna sit me down and tell me how much money she spent, you know, cause I'm the boss. <laughs> Don't you, don't you spend no more money than I said you could spend. You know who I am, right? You better ask somebody. Because I thought that's where she, you know, because I called her all day to get prices. Like, how much was the fence? How much was the fence? How much was the fence? She said, babe, I got some prices. We talk about it when you get home. And she sat me down and she said, babe, I need to talk to you. I said, if you spent more than $5,000 on that fence, we're going to talk, all right? <laughs> And I didn't recognize at the moment that my daughters and my mother-in-law were on the back porch and the only people in my house was my wife and my father-in-law. And she said, your mom had a bad car accident yesterday. And I said, is, is, is mom all right? And she said, your mom's fine, she's a little banged up. I said, oh, thank God. She said, but Robin, and I said, but Robin what? She said, but Robin went out the window and the van landed on top of her and she didn't make it. And Robin was my 17-year-old baby sister. She was my father's nephew's child that my parents adopted. She was born addicted to cocaine. She was born with jaundice and addicted to alcohol and methamphetamine and heroin. And she really couldn't read or write. And my parents adopted her when she was about seven. We had her from three months old. My parents adopted her when she was about seven and she couldn't read and write. And two weeks before that, she graduated from Havasu High School in Arizona with a 3.5 grade average. She persevered and she pushed through and they were on their way back from San Diego State where she went down to apply for college. There was four kids, three junkies and a good kid. I miss my baby sister. And I got on the plane and we flew out. We landed in Vegas and my father's best friend came and got us and drove us and we walked in the house and my mother came to me. I'm the oldest and my mother said, baby, I don't know what we're gonna do because I don't think we're gonna make it and I told her that God loved her so much that he'd walk her through the pain if she would just allow him to walk her through the pain. I went into my sister's room and she wasn't there. And I went on the computer desk because she wasn't there. And I went out the back door to the pool and she wasn't there. And I just started looking up into the sky and I started telling God that I didn't understand why but that I felt all alone and I needed him to hold me and I needed him to understand that I needed him right now. And he came my father out the back door and my father's about 6'3", 270 pounds and he came out the back door and he was standing on the other side and I looked over and I said, Dad, you're gonna be all right. And he looked at me and he started to cry and he said, son, now that you're here, I know it's gonna be all right. Son, I know that you're strong enough to help me to get through this, son. Son, your God is going to get me through this, son, because you know I don't believe. Son, I need your God, son. I hope you all remember that in May of 92, he promised to shoot me. <laughs> so y'all can't tell me Narcotics Anonymous don't work.
Is Saad Yazid in the room? Saad Yazid, are you in the room? Saad, could you meet me at this door? My father came over, man, and he put his head on my shoulder and he started to sob and he started to tell me how he loved me. And so you never know what God will use to bond and heal relationships that are damaged beyond recognition. See, the disease of addiction thought it was going to steal my joy by taking my sister, but what it forgot was I serve a mighty God. It forgot that the God I serve is so mighty that it will turn a curse into a blessing. If you just become obedient to the God you serve, all curses become blessings. God takes all bad things and turns them into good. And I remember sharing an early recovery that God tested me. But what I understand today is it's the destructive force that tests me. It's God's grace that sees me through the test. And we buried my sister and I put my 10-year medallion in her urn. I was going through my wallet the other day in my truck. When I opened my wallet, there was a picture of her when she was like nine years old. And I told her that I loved her. I told her that I missed her and that someday we'd be back together because she was such a good kid. And we came home, man. I never missed a beat. I started going back to meetings. I started calling my sponsor. I started working with the men I sponsor, and I let people help me, man. I'm telling you, I got phone calls from, from Kentucky and Alabama and New York and California. I got calls from folks I didn't even know because the word got out. Folks started calling me, telling me stuff like, Jimmy, if you need, I'll get on a plane, I'll be there tomorrow. Jimmy, we love you so much and we need you to stay clean because we need you to help us. Jimmy, you're so important in my life. See, y'all have no idea, man, when, when I come to places like this and I do stuff like this and cats and, and, and women and, and, and folks start coming up to me and, and and a lot of times they think that I'm not paying them no mind, but I get so overwhelmed when you folks come to me and you tell me, I got your tape, man, and it was your tape that changed my life. It was, it was your message that you shared about your struggles and didn't use that saved my life. And y'all don't understand that a lot of days when I don't want to do the next right thing, that it's you folks that help me through God's grace to do the next right thing. I need y'all to be telling me stuff like you need me in your life because deep down inside, I I still have the need to be needed. See, I'm not the addict that talks about I'm a 12-step member and I don't sweat that stuff anymore. And I don't, you know, I hear a lot of cats on me talking about I don't do that anymore and I'm not there anymore. And listen, all my defects have been arrested, but anything that's been arrested can be paroled. <laughs> And guess who the warden is on the parole board? Guess who got the final say whether or not we release the defect? That would be me. We came home, man, and we just kept moving. We just kept moving. We just kept moving. And all of a sudden, my wife started going through some physical problems again. And, you know, her cycle was every day instead of every 28 days. And I mean... Y'all, listen, listen up, relax. Breathe in, breathe out. I ain't talking about the sex piece. We get to that in a minute. But we went to the doctor and he found out and he diagnosed her with cervical cancer. And in January of last year, he did a surgery and it didn't work. And in March, he did another surgery and it didn't work. And in May, he took everything. And six months ago, 
he found polyps on her ovaries. And I hate to be graphic, but I just need to. He found polyps on her ovaries, and he believes they're cancerous. So now he's going to treat them for a period of time. And she went for a mammogram three weeks ago. And I, we were in Atlanta last week. And I got home from work Monday, and there's a mass in one breast and cysts in the other breasts. And I'm at the point now where I'm like, when is my wife going to catch a break? See, the 12 step says we have a growing concern for others. I got a God, and there's an armor around me. If you got a God, you understand what I'm talking about. There's an armor around me that's impenetrable. Nothing can get through that armor of God in my life, but it's my wife that don't have a God that I'm concerned about. It's my wife who don't believe. I had my wife believing. And I say I did because it was my practical application of a relationship with God that had my wife starting talking about, look what God did. You believe God did that? Look what God did. Do you believe God did that? Look what God did. Do you believe God did that? I was like, ah, oh, dog, you go, girl. <laughs> You got a God, I'm so happy. Oh, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. You go, you got a God, I'm so happy. Oh, go, go, go. Oh, now I ain't got to be telling you about God. You could be telling me about God. Oh, you got a God. And then her grandmother died on her birthday. And she said, there ain't no God. And then she got sick and there's still no God. She gives all the props to the doctors. That's just where my wife is. I'm not kicking my wife's back in, trust me. I'm just talking about a growing concern for others. I'm at the point now, man, I, I just lay in the bed at night with my wife and, and, and we, you know, some stuff came, came to pass in the last three weeks. Some insecurities were arose in me and my spirit. I've always been an insecure man. I've been with my wife almost 23 years, married almost 15 years. I've never been outside my marriage. I've never been with another woman. My wife's never been with another man. But most days, I think that she's stepping out. She talk about, she just mentioned a joker's name. I'll be like, Ashley, what do he look like? Do he got hair? Baby is, that, baby, is that the millionaire client, baby? Is that her millionaire client? Baby, is that her millionaire? Baby, do she kiss him? Y'all laugh, that's some sick shit to put your kids in. Yeah. And we had a falling out a couple weeks ago and a lot of stuff arose about some insecurities that I had pushed down. And it was all my stuff. My wife didn't even play a part in it. She was just the other person. I was getting ready to go in this joker's mouth. I was getting ready to go find him. It was from 15 years ago when we got married. This cat asked her to run away with him. And then he was at my wedding congratulate me on my marriage. And I heard about him asking her to run away with him. But I ain't never say nothing because my wife ain't never held nothing from me. So when she didn't tell me he said that, I didn't think it was true. Well, two weeks ago, she told me he said that. And you know, the disease said you was right all along. <laughs> she ain't shit. <laughs> she ain't run away with that joker. She ain't never even date him. But my insecurities caused havoc in my marriage for a couple weeks. I love to stand up here and tell you, yeah, I'm, I'm a big, strong man. I don't sweat no joker taking my wife's shit. <laughs> that ain't my story. <laughs> strong, confident belief in oneself for me is completely consumed in my belief in my recovery process. But my manhood is suspect to me on a lot of days. You know, I'm still caught up in that. If you ain't knock a hundred girls down, you ain't shit. I'm still caught up in that I'm not all the things my wife would desire to have. She ain't never told me that. I'm talking about how the disease tries to steal your joy. How your disease tries to cause some havoc in a spot where there's no havoc. 
where the disease sneaks in and says, boy, you ain't shit, ain't never gonna be shit. Your father was right. But my father was so far from the truth. My father had no idea the potential I had. See, I hear a lot of cats come up here and talk about my parents did the best they could. I don't buy into that nonsense no more. My parents did what the hell they wanted to do. You know why I'm saying that? Because I got girls at home. And I can rest on my laurels that I'm doing the best I can do. That's some old nonsense. A lot of days I do what the hell I want to do. A lot of days I don't be doing stuff that I should be doing with my daughters. I'd be too tired. But last week I got to the airport, man, going to Atlanta, and, and my oldest daughter, I opened my CD player and there was a piece of paper in there with a handprint with pink fingernails, and inside the hand it said, when you feel lonely, just hold my hand, Daddy. You don't have to be alone. <laughs> and on the bottom of it it said, love you, Daddy Ashley. You know, when I went home, I kissed her and I hugged her, and I got a four-year-old, right? And she said, well, you know me love you too, right? <laughs> I said, yeah, baby, I know you love me. And she put a note in there. I don't know what it said. <laughs> she told me Friday I was getting ready to leave for the airport. She said, Daddy, it's a sweet kid, so don't tell nobody, but I put a note in your CD case. <laughs> And if you don't cry, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> I've become my daughter's hero. I've become my wife's hero. See, because all of this is great. I love doing this, man. I, if, if I could travel the country and share all the time, I would do that. I love to do this. I, this is me. This is my atmosphere. I love to do this. A lot of folks tell me I should be doing something else and should be moving on to other things. And, but you know what? God saved my life not to do those things, but to help people in Narcotics Anonymous. God didn't take my now behind out of the gutter and get me clean and raise me up so that I could leave the very place that he raised me up in. So that I forget, so that the newcomer doesn't hear the message of hope, the promise of freedom. That an addict, any addict, black addict, white addict, gay addict, straight addict, confused addict, homeless addict, don't know if you are addict, don't know if you belong here, don't know what you did, don't know if you didn't do it. You're welcome in Narcotics Anonymous. See, God wants us to share that message. I believe God uses me in a lot of avenues. I, I've been blessed to go a lot of places. A lot of the places I seem to go seem to be down south. I go to a lot of conventions where I be, sometimes I'm the only white person there. I'll be like, God, what's up with that? <laughs> but you understand, I understand. You know, my thing is, if we go right back to the disease, I ain't gonna be the token white boy Shan in a predominantly black convention. Why not? Maybe God knows that you've met the condition to go down there telling folks that skin color don't mean nothing. When you talk about Isnak Eleven's banquet, don't say this white boy shared, say this recovering addict, a member of Narcotics Anonymous who bears no color. I'm talking about, we need to learn to set that side, that stuff aside, man. Our prejudices that go on in Narcotics Anonymous, regions separating, areas trying to leave. I ain't going to that meeting, it's mostly black folks. I ain't going there, it's mostly white folks. I ain't going there, there's gay people there. I ain't going there because of this. That's that old bullshit. You ain't care who the hell you cop from. You ain't, you ain't care, you ain't care if the dude was white, black, or green. Now all of a sudden we come to narcotics. I got I need to be a proud white man. That's that bullshit. That's the disease of addiction trying to squeeze its way into narcotics anonymous. Don't think he ain't up in this camp right here tonight. 
Don't think the disease ain't sitting up front and center. Don't think the disease ain't grab hold of a couple addicts in this room tonight talking about that boy don't know what he's talking about. I know how powerful the disease of addiction is. The purpose is to steal your joy. Don't let it steal your joy. Don't let the disease in. You don't got to let the I hear folks talk about, I did that because I'm an addict. Hell no. You did that because you wanted to do that. I cheated on my wife because she ain't give me none. No, you cheated on your wife because you impatient. <laughs> I'm talking about 14 months, no sex in my house. 22 months, no sex in my house. I ain't go outside my marriage. But I want y'all to understand my commitment don't lie in my relationship to my wife. My commitment lies in my relationship to Almighty God. <laughs> I refuse to cheat on God and myself. I refuse. For what? For 30 seconds of pleasure? I mean, listen, I'm talking about, I'm talking about how, how I have a hard enough time dealing with one woman. What am I do with two women? I don't know what to do with the one I've been with 23 years. What am I going to do with some new Jack? I gotta buy her flowers and quarter and take her out to dinner too? Hell no. I ain't talking about I don't look. There's some fine women in Indiana. God dog, there's some fine women. See, I'm learning, man. I'm learning how to treat my wife like the queen that she was created to be. My wife ain't a piece of meat to serve my physical desires. She's a spiritual being that God placed specifically in my life so that I can help to raise her up to a relationship with God so that she could raise me up to a relationship with God so we could raise our children in a relationship with God. What I want to talk about is having a relationship with God. I want to talk about relationship with God. Not the good morning God, thank you for waking me up. Thank you God for keeping me clean type relationship. You know how we do. All right, God, you got me up. I'm grateful. I right, keep me clean. I'm going to do whatever I want to do all day. Oh, thank you, God, for keeping me clean. What about during the day when that near, that near miss accident happened on the job? When somebody dropped something and it didn't hit you, you, you forgot to thank God for his grace again. Try having a relationship with your wife and just say good morning and good night. That's no different than the relationship with God. I'm talking about having a relationship. I got relationships with people in Narcotics Anonymous. I'm talking about Randy came up and introduced me, man. That cat drove to Atlanta five hours last week to come support his sponsor. The cat drove five hours this week to come support his sponsor. I'm talking about love, unconditional love. That brother loves me right where I'm at. Allows me to be me. Sponsorship is the heart of the N.A. way. Yes, Jimmy and Nelson got on a plane, took money out of their own pocket to come to Indianapolis to support their sponsor. I'm grateful. I love you guys, man. Y'all have no idea what a relationship with sponsorship is like until you have one. I had the same sponsor for ten and a half years. About 15 months ago, I moved on. My sponsor went in a direction that was a little different than the direction I was going in. I ain't kicking his back in. I'm so grateful that he helped me to become the man that I am. I want to talk about how he was a black man from Harlem who shot dope. White boy from Jersey smoked crack. He slept on a foam couch. I had a fly apartment. Everything about us was different. But he had what I wanted. I was willing to get what he had. So I went. I followed him. I got in his pocket. I made meetings regular. For four years, I did not miss a meeting. I hear cats talk about I got 30 days and got a life. God dog, how you did that? How you get a life in 30 days? It took a lifetime to destroy what little bit of life you did have. I got responsibilities. 
Me too, I still make meetings regular. But what's regular for me might not be regular for you. Regular coffee for me is light with four sugars. For you, it might be black. See, so what's regular for me, it ain't regular for you. I don't tell the men I sponsor how many means to make. Make enough so you're comfortable. The literature says we return to the mainstream of life. The mainstream. I got a life, but stuff I do, coach softball, go to dance recitals. Both of my dad and my daughters, they're dancers. They won gold and platinums last week. I, I'm, I'm at Atlanta, I come down and my phone's blowing up. It's the four-year-old. Daddy, me got a platinum. Daddy, me got a platinum. Daddy, me got a platinum. I said, what's a platinum, baby? She said, I don't know, but me got one. <laughs> I want the newcomer to know, man, that you never have to use again. I want you to know that if you don't use, you get an NA sponsor, you get a basic text, it works in how and why, just for today, and the new step working guide. I know a lot of folks are afraid of this. I don't know what you're scared about. The worst thing that can happen is you're gonna get better. But I will pull some covers. I'll tell you what they're scared of. In the surrender piece, page six in, in the first step, yeah. it says, there is a huge difference between resignation and surrender. Resignation is what we feel when we realize we're addicts but haven't yet accepted recovery as the solution to our problem. Recovery is not fellowship. Recovery is not service commitments. Recovery, as found through the 12 steps and 12 traditions, as identified in IP number two, the group pamphlet. So all that other stuff you think is recovery ain't recovery. This is a practice ground. We practice our new way of life here, and we take when the rubber hits the road on the outside, when y'all ain't around. How you living then? Are you living right when ain't nobody looking? Are you stealing that penny candy when ain't nobody looking? You got $200 in your pocket. Are you cursing folks out? Are you of service to your community? Are you saying hello to folks even when you don't know folks? Are you a beaming beacon of light outside of Narcotics Anonymous? Can you show respect and love for human beings regardless of age, race, sexual identity, creed, religion, or lack of religion? The book, the, 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 the medallion says the addict it says we carry this message to others, not other addicts. We don't just carry the message up in this camp. This is the simple stuff to do. We come here, we quote the book, we talk about the steps, we talk about God, but how you living for real, for real. Take your own inventory. Don't worry about where I'm at. Don't worry about how I'm living. I mean, damn, I was invited someplace and got called two weeks later and said, we heard you used. I said, well, that's good, because today's May 1st, and I'm celebrating 10 years clean. They said, for real? Said, yeah, I didn't use. See, because there's blessing blockers in this camp. How much time I got before I go into this? Am I right? But I want to talk about surrender, then we do blessing blockers. It says, surrender, on the other hand, is what happens after we've accepted the first step as something that is true for us and have accepted that recovery is the solution. Yeah, blessing blockers. You know the cats that are up in this camp who kick your back in every chance they got? Why I got to hear that boy again? I ain't invite myself here. Tommy and Kim called and said, do you want to come? So if you're tired of hearing me, get with Kim and Tommy after the meeting. <laughs> I got your back, girl. <laughs> jersey in the house, we got you. You don't need Jersey, I'll handle <laughs> <laughs> But I'm talking about the addicts that come up in here and don't change. They remain the same. They stay clean for years and years and years. They still low, low down, dirty, slimy, greasy, funky, and smelly. The only thing they changed is their clean date. And they want to kick your back in because you're working steps. 
Slow down, boy, you're moving too fast. It's a pace, not a race. Well, it's a race for my life. And the 12th step in the basic text says, the steps do not end here, it's a new beginning. A lot of folks think we only do one fourth step and the 10th step keeps us free, but that ain't true. The fourth step and it works how and why says whether it's our first, our fifth, or our 20th fourth step, because we're like an onion unpeeling. I've done three fourth steps. I've never written about the insecurities in my marriage because it was never prominent in my life. But check this out. I'm getting ready. I was listening to Shelly from Oakland in the sixth and seventh step meeting today talk about she's looking forward to six. And I'm looking forward to writing another fourth step because I want to deal with my insecurities. Every time my wife says no in the bedroom, I don't want to go right to that's because she won't be with the other joker. I want to go with my wife's got the right to say no. I want to be able, I want to be comfortable. See, a lot of folks don't like to come up in here and tell the truth about how, how they living and how they feeling because cats want to kick their back in. See, I told you he wasn't all that. I ain't never proclaimed to be all that. You can't be a famous person in an anonymous program. Am I well known? No doubt. No doubt I'm well known. But you know what that means? That I'll stay clean today. The disease of addiction is not impressed in how many banquets I did, how many tapes I got, and it's not impressed in how many of y'all come up and tell me how much you love me. It's not impressed by my clean time, how many men I sponsor, what state I'm from, whether or not I could quote all the books or not. It ain't impressed. Because for everything I do, the disease does two of them. Every time I talk about how good God is, the disease says, yeah, but I'm going to pull your covers. Because you think God's good. See, deal with this. Deal with this. Take this. And the disease comes in the blessing blockers. And all. I didn't get off the topic. The disease comes in the blessing blockers. You know, they come in the meeting and they sit, they sit next to a new jack who don't know no better. Yeah, that boy ain't shit. That boy don't mean, that boy ain't shit. Yeah, big deal, he could quote the book, a parrot could quote the book. Don't listen to that boy, he full of shit. Meantime, all they really want to do is be up here speaking. Instead of saying, I'd like to be where you're at, they say, he ain't shit, she ain't shit. He ain't nothing, he ain't doing nothing for us. He ain't hug me, did you hug me? See, you know, I, I work real diligently at, at when folks come and hug me, I introduce them to the people I'm with. Because that's so rude, man. That's rude. Folks know me. Jimmy T, how you doing? They hug me and bounce. I got eight jokers with me. Well, you wouldn't be knowing Jimmy T if it wasn't for them jokers. Let's not get it twisted. If it wasn't for the men I sponsor and the men they sponsor and the men they sponsor, you wouldn't know about me. We need to learn how to love everybody, like not just the folks we know, I mean, I watch when I go to conventions. We just be hugging the folks we know. I don't like him. I don't like her. She thinks she all that. She might be. Maybe it ain't that she thinks she all that. Maybe you don't think you anything. See, I'm talking about, man, we need to learn how to love each other. Our goal here is to raise each other up. We come in here hating ourselves and hating each other. And then we kick each other's backs in. I don't be understanding that stuff. When I got, in 80, when I got here in 86, the stuff was like, sit down, shut the F up, you don't know nothing about nothing. I, went, like, I came in here beat down. Last thing I needed for you to do was tell me that. <laughs> See, I, I heard Dow's story uh, several times. He talked about his sponsor put his foot in his ass. If my sponsor put his foot in my ass, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. Each individual is different. We need, some of us need to be loved when we get here. Some of us need to be courage, cherished, encouraged, the fan, the flame of desire. We need to be told that we're something in somebody, that we're going to be special. We need to be told that we are somebody. Not because we're the speaker, just because we are. I mean, I'm talking about, man, the new love and Narcotics Anonymous. We need to start doing those types of things, man. Stop turning your back on the addict that can't stay clean. That was me. I'm going to share this and shut up. I'm quite sure I'm out of time. 
Because y'all will let me share all night. Y'all just don't know. I remember May 1st, 1992, I went to a meeting in an area that I live. And I walked in the meeting, and I got a white key tag, and there was a group of five men with five years or more clean. And they, they didn't whisper it, they said it out loud. I don't know why that boy getting another white key tag, he ain't never gonna stay clean. Nelly says it, right? If my uncle could see me now. If those five jokers could see me now. I'm talking about, man, you never know who gonna be your sponsor. The same cat you kick his back in may be your sponsor, whether you use or not. I got a guy at home with 14 years clean. He kicked my back in for the first four years I was clean. Now I'm his sponsor. Picture that. And I ain't bragging about that. I'm just saying that the, the transformation in my life spiritually was an attraction to him once he got past his prejudices towards me. Because he stayed clean when he got here. You know, I'm a first-time winner, too. The first time I came here to get clean, I stayed clean. Yeah. My first 22 trips here, I didn't come here to get clean. I came here for a tune-up and oil change. So my wife would leave me alone. We need to read It Works How and Why. We need to read the traditions and it works how and why. Where it talks about setting aside our prejudices, our preconceived notion. That's what a prejudice is. It's a preconceived notion. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. He got a big ass. I don't know, Dow. But because I don't like the way he look, I've decided I can't be his friend. Based on what? You know, we need to learn how to set that stuff aside. We need to learn how to love each other. Let's meet each other where we're at. God met you where you were at on your first day clean. Let's meet each other where they at. I was looking at the, at the, the breakdown, the clean time. Can everybody with 30 days less or clean please stand up? Here's the hope. Here's the hope shot. Here's the hope. Is Nack 16. One of those cats can be your banquet speaker. If you guys fan the flame of desire in their heart and spirit, one of those cats can be your banquet speaker. See, that's the hope. And I know one of y'all out there want to be up here doing this. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. Go on and do you. Because God will bless you tremendously if you just surrender your life and your will to his care. If anything I said helped you, remember we invited God in. If anything I said offended you, hopefully you got a sponsor. <laughs> the message is hope, the promise is freedom. That an addict, any addict, can stop using drugs, lose the desire to use drugs, and find a new way to live. It ain't about just staying clean, it's about the last sentence, a new way to live. I am not living the same life I used to live even yesterday. The message is hope, the promise is freedom. You never, 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 never have to use again. Thanks for letting me share.